All right, I think we're live. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Swati Kankan. I am working with Kanan Animal Welfare as the Director of Partnerships. And Dog Spot is hosting me and Irene here today. Uh, Irene is a volunteer with Operation Paws for Homes, which is a rescue organization in the United States. Uh, they primarily rescue from overcrowded shelters in the southern part of the U.S. and find adoptive homes for them in the Washington, D.C. area. And they also work with a uh, core in bringing a small number of uh, our dogs into the U.S. and helps find them wonderful homes yeah. under this program called the DC Dog Program. So Irene, over to you. Great, thank you. It's uh, delightful to be here. Uh, and I've uh, met Swati a couple times and wonderful to be doing this from far away. Uh, my apologies for being so bright on the screen. There's something with my, uh, my screen that's uh, making me glow. <laughs> So I'm not usually quite so um, bright, uh, but I haven't been able to quite fix that. So thank you everyone um, for joining us. So just so you know uh, how I got involved. So I live actually in Baltimore, Maryland, which is um, about four, uh, 45 minutes away from Washington, D.C., where I work uh, in D.C. Um, but as, as a volunteer, I have gotten very involved in animal rescue issues. Um, and so uh, my story on how I get involved was I've always loved dogs and about three and a half years ago, uh, we had a dog died of cancer and was looking for a new dog. And I had heard of Operation Pause for Homes. So I looked on their website and I saw a dog from India amongst many, many other dogs available. And I thought, that's interesting. I've been to India before and she seems like a nice dog. And um, so we adopted her. Uh, and her name is Maya. Uh, and I toyed with having her in the room with me here, but I just never know if she might bark or jump on me to get, you know, get, get petted. And so I thought I would leave her outside of the room. Um, but she really was a life changer for me. She was a wonderful dog. Her photo was in the, the, um, the ad for this, the, the, the little screenshot for this, uh, for this session, the black dog that's with me, if any of you saw that um, in the uh, publicity for this session. And um, she was just an amazing dog. And I became very interested in where she came from and her story and all that. So I ended up connecting with some other adopters initially of dogs from India who had come through again, Operation Pause for Homes or OPH. And then um, uh, uh, through Facebook connections, ended up connecting with, with Vandana uh, Anchalia, who's the uh, founder of CAW, who I know was on a session here a few weeks ago and just got really, really interested and ended up visiting India, just thinking what the heck I would like to go on a vacation. This was three years ago, two and a half years ago. And uh, just fell in love with the place and OPH was really supportive and said, you know, we'd love you to do more volunteer work. And so that sort of was the start. And I ended up getting a little bit involved and then a little bit more involved and a little bit more involved. <laughs> Until now, it takes up all my free time um, and, and I love it uh, very much. Um, so that's kind of how I got involved. Um, Swati, if you want, I can talk a little more about OPH and about how we do yeah, the work in was, India. Yeah. Um, basically. Definitely. Great. Yeah. So it, this is yeah. Um, this has become my passion is is working with with these dogs. Um, OPH is primarily a uh, dog rescue that works in the United States. So we have uh, been around about ten years. Over ten years, have adopted out uh, about ten thousand dogs, almost a thousand dogs a year, and almost all of them come from overcrowded shelters in the southern part of the United States. Uh, where there are a uh, much higher uh, number of dogs being brought into shelters. Many end up getting euthanized because they don't have enough space. Whereas in the northern part of the country, up here, uh, like near Washington, D.C. and other parts in the north, there's actually a lot of adopters and fewer adoptable dogs. There's lower, um, less shelter crowding in the north for assorted reasons. And so OPH brings up dogs from the south to adopters in the north uh, or in th this area, as do quite a number of other rescues. It's a common thing to try to um, get the dogs to where the adopters are. Um, and so um, that's what we do. Uh, but we have this international, this small international program. So of the, about a thousand dogs a year, though it's a little higher this year for reasons we'll talk about later, we've had more dogs this year in general being adopted. Um, the India program is small. We've brought 70, over, a little over 70 dogs over the last four years. So it's 20 to 25 dogs a year. So a very small part of OPH's work, but I think a very important and meaningful one. Um, and, um, you know, we've gotten great support from the rescue and from very committed adopters and, and, uh, people who are, who are interested in, in these dogs. Um, so that's, uh, sort of the story of, of, of OPH. 
right now, of course, we can't we can't bring dogs, which is very sad. <laughs> so yeah. I'm actually now. Yeah, we just we need travel to start up again. Um, so I've been fostering some of the dogs, some of the dogs from from the south um, and helping out there. But I am very eager to uh, to get more uh, dogs from India as soon as as we are able to. Yeah, we're um, definitely waiting for that. Yeah. So <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about the entire foreign desi dog movement that you guys have over there? The, like how you guys go about spreading awareness for their adoption in the U.S.? Mm hmm. Yeah, it's re it's it's really very interesting. People who adopt these dogs that, you know, the Daisy dogs are very interesting. They're so smart. They're kind of complicated and they have amazing stories. Um, and a lot of people who've adopted like myself or fostered sort of really fall in love with them. Um, and so we have a very committed group of volunteers here who help out in different ways. OPH is entirely a foster based organization. So when we bring dogs either from the south or from India, um, they go not to a facility, but they go to a foster home to volunteers. And we have several hundred who keep the dog for a week or two until or longer until they get adopted. Uh, and it gives us a chance to evaluate them, see what their behavior is like. We, we screen them ahead of time to make sure they're considered, you know, adoptable. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll fit into homes, but we want to know more about, you know, do they do okay with cats? Do they like other dogs? Do they like a quiet environment? Do they need a lot of exercise or are they like to sleep a lot? Um, and also make sure they don't have any health issues. We do some basic stuff like deworming and stuff just to get them settled. And then we, we look for homes. So we do the same thing with the dogs from India. Um, there, of course, it's, uh, we don't have regularly scheduled transports of dogs. It's, uh, right. dogs from the South every two weeks. We have a van that comes up with dogs from India. We are essentially waiting uh, and pre COVID, you know, we would be trying to recruit flight volunteers. So someone who's already traveling for business or pleasure or vacation, um, who is willing to take a dog, they don't have to really do anything. Um, the rescues on both ends, Ka in India, OPH here, uh, take care of all the paperwork. They pay the, the excess baggage fee. They, you know, bring you the dog to the airport. We pick up at the other end. So I, I or other volunteers will pick up dogs, uh, usually at Dulles Airport outside Washington, D.C. Um, and so the traveler just sort of needs to kind of get the dog on through the check in. And um, so it's a it's a great, you know, kind of a fun way to volunteer. Uh, we're always trying to find people who are doing that um, and who can um, uh, who are able or are on a flight that will allow dogs. And so we were always looking for that. And some of us individually have actually gone over to visit Ka and then have brought back have brought back dogs. So. Uh, once they get here, they go to a foster home. I fostered a bunch of them. Uh, other people have as well. And we get them settled and then start the process of um, looking for adopters. Uh, OPH as a whole, because we are adopting out, again, a thousand dogs a year or more, we have a whole you know website with all the dogs. We, we do social media. We do events. Again, some of this a little changed recently. We can't do as many events because of right. COVID. Um, uh, we have a lot of ways to get the word out. Um, and so OPH is always getting adoption, uh, applications for dogs, and then they go through a screening process. Um, some people apply in general, some people apply for a specific dog, uh, and then, um, and ultimately will find the dog that they want. Um, but our screening consists of, um, uh, you know, we make sure that if they're renting, that they're, the landlord allows dogs or allows any breed of dog. A lot of places here have restrictions on like the size of a dog. We make sure that that you know, we understand that we have some references, so people will have a someone they know say you know um, write up a you know their kind of um, their uh, their uh, experience with animals or their interest in animals. If they have pets, we will check with the vet to make sure that the animal's up to date and all that. And then we do an interview with the applicant, and then they get approved to adopt. So we have volunteers who do all of those things, um, and then they can look at different dogs. They can. Um, meet them um, and ultimately uh, adopt. And then we have assorted supports. We have trainers, who, volunteer trainers who can help out. We follow up with adopters for the international dogs, for the Daisy dogs. Um, and there are also, we did bring some dogs from Kosovo, um, from some of the Caribbean islands. So there've been a few other international dogs as well, but it's primarily the India dogs. We do one additional interview, which either I do or my partner, Jill Trail, my, my friend who's been uh, very active um, my partner in crime was what I was going to say, but um, American <laughs> phrase, no crime involved. It's all, it's all a wonderful work that we do. She or I will interview, uh, we'll do one additional conversation with someone interested in one of the international dogs. And that's because we really want to explain, you know, tell people the story of where these dogs come from, how their temperaments can be a little bit different, make sure they understand 
Um, uh, and also it gives us a chance to then offer more support. So after the dog gets adopted, we I will follow up with them, say, how are things going? We have a Facebook group for adopters of the international dogs where they can share stories and it helps people uh, keep people connected. Um, yeah, because it doesn't end once the dog goes to the new home, right? You continue having a bond with that family as well. They've joined right. the community. Right, right. And almost all of them actually really like that. You know, there's a few that, that you know, say everything's fine and don't join the Facebook group. But um, for the most part, and it's a small enough number of dogs at 74 that we've brought that pretty much everybody has been engaged and involved. It's a little harder for OPH as a whole with 10,000 dogs, you know, to, to yeah, you know, so many people. But we have the common bond of the dogs having come from India. Um, and so I love it because I, I, keep up with the dogs I fostered, but also dogs I transported from the airport or dogs I've met or dogs I knew at CA when I visited uh, or interviewed the adopter. And so they feel like, you know, my, my children, maybe my grandchildren is a better term. <laughs> uh, and I think others feel a sense of connection too. Um, we also uh, do things. We've had two annual reunions of dogs uh, last year and the year before. We hope to do one this year, again, if things are safe to, to get together. Um, so people can come and bring their dog and, you know, and, uh, and get together. And we do periodic, uh, what we call pack walks where we'll meet at a location somewhere, somewhere in the region of DC, Virginia, Maryland, the States that are right around DC, um, at a park or something. And anyone who wants can bring their dog. That's a good setting for dogs to meet and a tip for any dog owner. Um, a lot of dogs are nervous if you, you know, if they run at each other to meet, but if you walk them in parallel, the dogs have a chance to get to know each other a little, especially for the daisy dogs who are often a little more nervous around new dogs because on the street, yeah. a new dog could be, could be dangerous. Right. Yeah, uh, we walk them in parallel and then the dogs start to warm up. And if they don't like each other, we put one person at the front of the pack and the other at the back of the pack. And um, that has been uh, quite successful. Um, and that is, in fact, when I do this extra interview, what I say about the street dogs is they are amazing dogs. They're so smart. They are so, um, uh, uh, they, they read their humans so well, and they have to, because on the street, someone could feed you or someone could throw something at you. And so they, you know, they look at you and you can see they're really trying to figure you out. Um, sometimes they're too smart for their own good. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but I always tell people, you know, the expectation in the U.S., and it's most dogs, not all dogs are like this, but the expectation is every dog wants to play with every other dog, meet every stranger, you know, go anywhere. And um, that's not true in general for lots of dogs aren't like that. But certainly the street dogs to, to you know, for generations to stay alive, you have to be cautious. And so we tell people who want to adopt one, just understand this dog you know, might not be the dog you take to the dog park to run and play. And that's okay. You know, if, if you really want that kind of dog, there are, we have other dogs for you. And some of them are. My dog, I actually do take to the dog park. Um, but they may be more suspicious of strangers. They may need a few more minutes to be introduced. And we just let people know. Um, and then they can decide to proceed or not. And I think that that really helps them to be prepared for the dog they, they will get. Again, the Daisy dogs vary in personality and temperament. Um uh, so they're not all going to be nervous, but, uh, or, or cautious is the word I like to use, but a lot of them right. are. And I think it helps if people yeah, kind of it's connect. Like, to I mean, Labradors have certain personality traits, like as a, as a breed, they have certain personality traits and you know that people are aware of those with Daisy dogs. It's the same thing. You tell them that it's a possibility that right. they will also have this trait like the others do. So it's, it's just educating right. them on that level. Exactly. And actually, even any even purebred dogs vary. I mean, I always tell people that in my neighborhood was in Baltimore here, there are lots of people with dogs. And there are there is one golden retriever and two Labrador retrievers who live nearby who lunge and snarl every time I every time we walk by. So, you know, they're not all. And then some of the you know, so it just they're, dogs are all individual, um, just like people. And uh, but there are broad characteristics. And certainly in general, the daisy dogs are a little more cautious. And so we just let people know that. But, you know, I, I really advocate for and, and being involved in rescue that there, are, you know, there are so many, there are so many different wonderful dogs that all deserve and and we can usually find a good adopter for every dog. Um, and it's just like kids. If you have a kid who's shy, like you may expect to have an extroverted kid who wants to play with everybody. You take the play group. Mm -hmm. If your kid is shy, if your kid is in, an introvert and nervous, you don't just shove them out there and say, go be an extrovert, right? You say, okay, yeah. let's make one friend and play with them. They will make another friend. You accommodate them. You work with them. And same with the dog. Not every dog wants to play with a big group of dogs. Not every person wants to hang out with a big group of people, right? Some people are, want the one-on-one. -on -one. So I think it's just understanding each dog is different. You work with them. You We try to find the right match. And I know 
I think you were going to ask a little bit about um, how we, you know, find the oh, right yeah, adop the, the adopter for the. And we really do. Um, we talk to people, you know, at some length, both in the initial interview. Um, sorry, my phone, another phone's ringing. Um, uh, and then in the interview we do about daisy dogs to understand, you know, do they live in a noisy area, quiet area? Do they have a busy life with lots of people coming and going? Do they have other animals? And then based on what the foster is saying about the dog, try to make sure that we're not putting, you know, a dog that doesn't like loud noises in the middle of downtown Washington, yeah. D.C. Um, and similarly, you know, if the dog really wants to chase a cat, we try to make sure they don't go to a home with a cat. Um, so you just you try to find the right match. And and this is true of dog rescue in general, not about the daisy dogs. Sometimes the matches aren't perfect. And so sometimes, and we then say, bring the dog back. We will find a, a better match. And often it is just that it's not quite the, or the dog is more energetic than the adopter realized. And they don't want to walk five miles a day with a, you know, excitable border collie. Um, and so, uh, and then sometimes things happen. People, people's lives change. They lose a job. They, somebody gets sick. And so the rescue takes back, will take back any, any dog. Uh, and that's any good rescue will do that. And then we always will find another placement for them and sometimes a better one. So, um, you know, our 74 Daisy dogs are all in wonderful homes. We have great adopters. There've been a few returns, but that's true for, uh, for, you know, dogs in general. And then we just find the better match for them. Um, so yeah. that's kind of how we, uh, how we do it. Um, it's, you can't always tell up front what the right match is. We try. Um, and there's always sometimes going to be people some trial and just, error, though. Like you, you can do your best. You yeah, can have as exactly. many interviews, but sometimes it's just the situation and how it plays out. Right, yeah. right, and something. Yeah, yeah. So we're always trying to improve that. But, um, but again, the dogs always end up in a good place, and I love to see them thriving with their with their new families and their adopters. The happy adoption pictures are the best. Like those make my life. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, one and it's also that based not yeah, go, go on. Go ahead. go ahead. Okay, I wanted to talk about fostering because I don't think it's very common in India. Like, I don't people people are not really so used to the concept of like bringing a dog home for a few months and going through some training, understanding the dog's behavior, preparing the dog for adoption. I think that's a lot more common abroad. So, if you could talk a little bit about that, so people who are watching this could get an idea of how how it goes, what's done. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think fo fostering is is really fun. I mean, it's hard sometimes, especially when the dogs first arrive, they're scared. They don't know. They don't, they don't know the house rules. They don't know. They don't know how to, you know, who to trust and whatnot. So um, you get kind of used to the first day or two can be rough, uh, especially when they're coming from India. They've just been on a, you know, 20, 30 hour flight when you add up all the, the, the time that they're in transit and they come out in a world that smells totally different, looks totally different. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's a huge shock for them. Um, and so, you know, we have a whole, in general, in fostering, the idea is you take them home and you give them a lot of time. Uh, no, I don't mean a lot of time, like months, but I mean, like the first few days, you don't take them out all over the place and meet lots of people and meet new dogs. You give them some quiet time. You maybe put them in their crate or a pen uh, for an hour or two to let them just relax, then spend all the time with them and, and get them used to uh, taking in the new things, understand, yeah, you're going to get fed twice a day. You're going to get petted. You're, you know, everything's going to be great. Uh, but it can take them a little while. And then we don't introduce them usually to, like if there's another dog in the household, we'll keep them separate for at least a day or two, sometimes for quite a bit longer, just till, again, they till they feel safe and comfortable. Yeah. Um, you know, you just space up dogs. Some dogs come and they're like, woohoo, I want to play. And so, you know, we'll introduce them sooner to other dogs. Other dogs really need more time. So, um, uh, and then we, again, we'll be giving them some, some dewormers and just, you know, bathing them and kind of getting them ready, evaluating their temperament. Um, and then you, you kind of get them, you know, you sort of work on housebreaking if they're not already, um, uh, you know, going to the bathroom outside, you work on all that. Um, so it definitely helps to have some dog experience, although at OPH, we will try to find easier dogs for newer fosters so that they, right. um, you know, they can kind of ease in and get more experience. Um, but it's, it's very fun. I mean, it's very hard when they go away and when they get yeah. adopted, it's hard. It's wonderful and terrible at the same time. Um, you know, they, um, uh, a lot of people, they call it foster failing, which is when you can't let go of your foster dog and you <laughs> adopt them. Of course, if you do that, your house fills up and then you can't foster anymore. So I have, yeah. we have determined in our household, we, are, we have fostered quite a few dogs up in the area of 20. And uh, we, we haven't, as hard as it's been, we, we don't um, keep them. And to me, it feels like, like having grandchildren. They're out there. I keep up with the adopters. I get photos. 
I sometimes will dog sit for them if they're nearby. I'll go visit. Um, it gets up to the, you know, the doctor if they want that kind of connection. And but they all have actually, and um, so it's it's wonderful. So it's it's hard to say goodbye, but you get to see them move on to a new life. But the the moment, and actually, I just had a dog adopted yesterday. There's the moment. Um, when you know you know they're going to a great place the adopter is so excited but the dog doesn't understand and the moment when you leave them or the person takes them and they they look at you like what why are you abandoning me and there's no way to tell them like this is actually you know it's just it's it's heartbreaking in that moment and then in a day or two they settle in and they're fine but my very first foster was a caw dog named lassie you may have Swati, I don't know if I don't think you I don't know if you ever met lassie but she's this beautiful collie like dog and she was very attached uh, to me and to our house and some sort of separation um, issues and has the best adopters. But the moment when they drove away is my first one. And she looked at me with such shock. Um, I mean, I just broke down crying, but you know, now she's ha happy as can be. And so you have to prepare yourself for that. Um, but it, it yeah. is, it's like you get to have lots of dogs and then some of them are not the best match. You know, we have a cat and some of our fosters have really wanted to chase the cat. So when they, when they get adopted, you're like, that's the best, you know, now the cat can relax yeah. and we can relax. So I love them all. Um, you know, some you're kind of ready to see go and some you wish would never leave, but, um, but it's a fun way to kind of one year and then you're helping many more dogs that way. You know, every dog that comes through your house, again, if everyone adopted their fosters, you would have no more fosters pretty quickly. Um, and this way you see them go on to, to a happy life and then you take the next one in. So um, at OPH, you can choose to foster, you know, one dog a year. Some people foster 50 dogs a year. It's completely up to you. And and my assumption is like, if you're looking, I know sometimes Carl will look for fosters. I assume you two would have that sort of flexibility that people can kind of take a dog when it works for them. Yeah, um, and then you know, you know, PH, if you're going to go on vacation, you don't take a foster that week or you have someone watch the dog. And so you can still have flexibility, but also have the feeling like you have lots of extra pets, which is, <laughs> which is very, um, okay. so. So I wanted to ask also about how, like, what do you consider a perfect match for an indie dog? Like, how do you define when you've found the right home? Or what are the different factors right. you would look at in the house and in the family? Right, <laughs> right. Right. And of course, it will vary by dog uh, and, and by people. I mean, uh, uh, and, and by the type of household. Um, uh, definitely, I mean, they, I usually it's I'm going to say this and then I immediately contradict myself. But um, typically, I would look for someone who has some dog experience because I feel like the daisy dogs sometimes do need a little more guidance and um, they're more nervous. And so you have to be comfortable with a dog that might not race up to the first dog and want to play. Um, and so usually like an understanding, a little bit of understanding of dog behavior. I don't think daisy dogs are harder. They're just different. And so I want to make sure people understand that. That said, my first two fosters from India both went to first time dog owners who did, including Lassie, the one who was so sad when, when she left. Um, and they've done wonderfully. So, you know, it really, it, it really depends. And it, it's, it's hard. I mean, um, you know, we will look at whether the dog, uh, so I have a cat and another dog, so I can see with my fosters how the dog does with other dogs and, and cats. Um, but again, generally looking for um, just really what we want is people who are, uh, again, you know, comfortable with, with dogs and understand training and understand this dog is, uh, is going to, you know, may, is, you're going to need to accommodate the dog a little bit as well as the dog accommodating you. I mean, I, okay. I've always looked at applications to see do they say here's all the car characteristics and dog I want or do they say which is fine people need a dog that fits their lifestyle but do they also say and I can offer a great home to a rescue dog I mean I think that kind of commitment to helping the dog is important too um, but that said yeah. I have yet to find like, the perfect formula for ask this question get this answer adopter is perfect I mean sometimes people yeah. They get excited about a dog. They want a dog, and they don't always know what it will be like. They'll say, "Sure, I'll take a dog who you know I I can deal with this or that issue." And then the dog shows up, and their life is you know, it it turns out to be harder for them for certain uh, characteristics. But again, we either help them work through it or we find another placement. Um, yeah. So I there's no magic formula. Um, I generally, uh, unless the Daisy dog is really really relaxed, I generally. Um, steer people with very young children away just because a nervous dog even if they're good with kids if they see something that scares them um you know they're not going to usually not going to hurt a kid but if they you know if they get nervous the parents might get nervous and worry and so yeah. um 
it's to the always, Daisy Dog. You, you don't want anything to happen. Like even you don't want a, a potential situation either, right? Yeah, and it's it's not that there's danger. It's just it's just a matter of um, uh, and even with I mean most dogs like a toddler. A toddler is hard on adults, right? They come stick their finger in your eye. They jump on you. It's a special dog that can handle that. And so and we OPH does have you know we do get super mellow dogs and and then it's really obviously it's very important that parents be teaching their kids how to interact. We right. OPH actually does some education and other things like spay neuter days and uh in, in the communities in the south where um this this dog overpopulation and education events and things and one thing we do is uh workshops again they've been somewhat suspended lately A lot of ways to get the word out. Okay, I think Irene is having some technical issues right now. She should be back in a minute. Um, this is also a good time for us to let people know that if they want, they can ask questions and Irene and I will take them towards the end of the session. So if you have any questions about cross-border adoptions, how you can contribute to this cause, or what it takes to be a good foster, just any questions that you have about this, you can let us know in the comments. Um, I'm going to just take a look at the comments and see if there's... anything over there that might... Um, that is something we can respond to right now. So uh, for general information, uh, OPH is one of the partners that uh, Canon Animal Welfare works with, who helps us with international adoptions. Um, uh, Taw rescues a lot of dogs who are in very poor physical condition, who might have some sort of injury, a disability, um, anything really. Uh, it can be a very bad illness. It can be just due to neglect or cruelty or abuse. So um, the sort of dogs we rescue usually require quite a few months of physical rehabilitation before they're up for adoption before they're in a condition where they can really, where they can manage themselves, where they can exist in a very pain-free uh, manner. So um, the sort of dogs that we work with are also the kind of dogs that most people are not usually looking to adopt. You, you don't really, when you're thinking of getting a puppy home, you don't think that, oh, I want to take home a three-legged dog. Um, so, uh, it's a little bit difficult for us to find those dogs good homes over here and it's very sad for us because these are these are wonderful dogs these are dogs with a very strong spirit who are always looking for a way to keep living so we want them to have the best lives they can and as part of that we do international adoptions um so there's a question from divya saying uh, asking how we could help from india so <laughs> Caw is in India, and there are so many animal welfare organizations over here doing excellent work. Um, one of the biggest issues there is, I think, is uh, an overpopulation issue. There are there are quite a few shelters, but after a point, every shelter is kind of up to capacity, and there's only so much that so many people can do. So fostering is an excellent way to help. That's why we've talked about it so much, so people understand the sort of impact it can have. Uh, apart from that, there's also, I mean, adoption is a big one. Irene is back. <laughs> so I'm... I was just addressing a question. <laughs> uh, 
uh, about I'm how so people sorry, my, my yeah. computer just crashed. It was it couldn't handle it. It couldn't handle all the excitement, <laughs> um, and it it just went dark. And I said no. And then it takes a minute to re. So I I uh, was hoping you guys were all carrying on without me. I am so sorry about that. I think it's time. Yeah, to I'm, I'm, I'm learning equipment. how to talk to myself. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to just finish this one person has asked how we can how they can help from India. So I was going over how fostering is a big way to help. Adoption is obviously always going to be a big way to help because you're opening up space and shelter so they can help more dogs. Plus, uh, when you choose to adopt, then you're also you're choosing not to buy, which is not making that decision is a big deal. Because when you buy a dog, you're kind of encouraging the pet industry, right? Not and not in a positive way. You're promoting some sort of exploitation. And unfortunately, in India, people don't really um, adhere to laws very strictly. So you have a lot of very bad breeding situations. Uh, so definitely adoption, foster, and do your part as a community. Uh, feeding dogs is very important. Spay and neuter, which is something that OPH also does educational workshops about. Um, I think spay and neuter is a very, very big thing. That, that's something that we as a country need to focus on for our dogs to do better. Uh, we can, honestly, this could go on, but I'm going to let Irene <laughs> take it back and continue. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you for the, the uh, little break there. Uh, my apologies. Um, just actually to build on what you were saying, what, what I had just been saying is that um, we do, tr we do um, uh, educational programs at libraries and schools about teaching kids how to uh, interact with dogs because a, a lot of issues with kids and dogs, obviously, you know, you, um, you try to, f you, you, uh, work with dogs to train them, but kids need to be trained too, to not go and put their hand in the face of the dog and jump on them. And that there's a process where you invite the dog to come to you, you watch, you ask the, the, the owner, is this dog, you know, is it okay if I pet your dog? It's consent basically same as, you know, I wouldn't go up to a stranger and, you know, and give them a big hug and start talking to them. That would be like, ah, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's just, it's uh, people forget that dogs are also have, may have a sense of personal space. They may not want to meet everybody. Not every dog, you know, needs to be friends with every person. And so trying to teach that to kids young. So um, uh, we try to do that. And then, as I said, sometimes with a shyer dog, even if the dog might like the, the, the kids in the family and do fine with them, you know, if you're going to have a lot of kids friends over, or if, you know, it just, it just could be too much for us more sensitive dogs. So depending on the dog, sometimes I would, um, I would lean towards only older kids for adopters of daisy okay. dogs, but it really, it really varies. And that's true again for the non daisy dogs too. There's, there's certainly dogs that would rather be an only dog would rather not be with, with kids. Um, and, 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 you know, and we, then there are dogs who would do excellent, like Brownie, for example. You've met Brownie. Multiple I have met Brownie, right? yes, and her adorable puppies. Yeah, and she she would. I feel like she would. She's a mother all the time. Like she would do. Ex she loves right. kids, even at her right. foster. So right. It really does right. depend on the dog and how the dog reacts to different people. Right, right. Um, just thinking of Brownie, and I know I'm sort of jumping the gun because I know you were probably going to ask soon about what has changed in uh, with with COVID. If you're um, yeah. Uh, thinking of Brownie and the many dogs at Ka that are we would love to bring to the U.S. and have already been sort of screened and are ready to come. We just can't okay. get them here. But, you know, what's interesting about, I mean, obviously COVID has been a terrible tragedy in terms of health and finances and, you know, for the world as a whole. And, uh, you know, the tiny, tiny silver lining is that we have seen and most rescues in the U.S. have seen just a flood of uh, applications of people who want to adopt a dog, you know, partially their yeah. home more they may be working from home their kids may be getting schooled from home they just may have more more time and flexibility and i think it's also a time where people want to do something positive they want the company they want the comfort uh and so you know bringing a pet into the home uh can do that and give people a sense of purpose and so we have just been oph as a whole has been getting a huge amount of applications we actually um you know every time a new group of dogs come in they get adopted immediately basically so we we actually sort of have trouble having enough dogs to you know to 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 provide to folks so we would um there's all these dogs at car waiting to come i have there's all like these adopters all that's waiting. missing yeah. <laughs> all that's missing is the airplane that brings them here so i am hoping of course that that will will change soon because we do have uh, anybody is so planning on flying to the us this is an excellent time to contact either of us we will be happy to send some dogs across with you right 
right <laughs> right absolutely um okay so um of course there must also be more people fostering right now there are a lot more adoptions yeah. so shelters are kind yes. of emptying out and we have a lot of our dogs waiting to come over there and get into families uh can you tell people a little bit about um some of your favorite adoption stories i think we have a slideshow uh about this. yes we have a, a few pictures of some of yeah. my favorite adoption stories so i think somebody is going to put the pictures up there we go so um this dog is named priya as you can see she has only three legs and in fact a lot of the dogs we have brought have either been tripods meaning they have only three legs we've brought a couple paralyzed dogs we bought a blind dog um, um, because you know we can usually we can find homes for those dogs this is priya and i show you her she's actually a very little dog she looks bigger in this photo it's a very beautiful photo um, i just find her story interesting because the um the woman who adopted this dog uh, her son, her adult son and daughter-in-law had adopted a dog um, from uh, from India via OPH. And she loved that dog so much. The mother who lived nearby and would often take care of the dog, she said, I don't want a daisy dog of my own. So she actually applied and was waiting for a dog. And when Priya came, she was the dog for her. So Priya now lives with a beagle um, and actually sees the 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 son's um, dog often. In fact, the um, the uh, couple that uh, the the who the son of the person who adopted this dog uh, actually was a transport volunteer for us and brought some dogs over when they went to visit India uh, last year. So Priya is just kind of a happy story of dog staying in the family of a family that wanted more Daisy dogs and now have uh, have uh, two of them again between the mom and the and the and the son. Um, we could show the next, and she's a very sweet dog. Who's up next? Uh, Bruce. This is Bruce, uh, also a tripod, as you can see. Uh, and that is the Grand Canyon in the background. Bruce was, um, and most of the dogs who are tripods uh, were usually typically hit by cars, of course. So Bruce was as well as a little puppy uh, came over um, and I fostered him. He was adopted at once and returned. It wasn't a good fit. And he um, came to me uh, the, when he came back. And I love Bruce. He's just a goof and a funny boy. And um, the couple who adopted him um, had had a, a dog from, from the U.S., a, a, a local dog who had gotten some kind of, um, might have been diabetes, something that ended up the dog needed to have uh, her leg amputated. And, um, and then, you know, after many years died. And they said when they saw this picture of Bruce, it looks just like their dog who had had an amputated leg as well. And they said, we need to have him. And they have been wonderful. They have taken him actually on a cross-country trip where he visited Grand Canyon and uh, Joshua Tree National Monument, which is out in California. And so uh, he, he's actually been all over the country, uh, living the good life. And he's just one of my, one of my favorite guys. Um, I feel like I could do with a trip like that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I just love that photo of him. Um, so what's okay. the, who's the next one? Oh. This is, uh, she was named, Co yeah, she's so cute. She was named Coffee at Ka. Her uh, adopter renamed her Kaylee. And this is a very sweet story. The adopter actually does crisis counseling from home. So she's on a phone line where people um, who are having serious issues are able to call and get, and get sort of, uh, you know, uh, support and 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 uh, and help and counseling. So she's listening to people's difficult stories all day. And she said, "I want a dog, a quiet dog, because I'm on the phone and can't have a dog barking. But someone who can be my comfort as I am trying to handle all of these, you know, painful stories from other people." So she adopted um, Coffee now, Kaylee, and says that she is just the most wonderful, comforting dog. And uh, and so it's just, so, it was, that was such a perfect match. Coffee uh, was a dog who loved to just sit and watch the world go by and didn't need a lot of exercise. Like, she's also a tripod, I think I mentioned that. So she uh, you know, she doesn't wanna go on long walks and she, the two of them are just happy together, giving each other you know the kind of support and love that they each need. So that is Coffee or Kaylee. Um, cute fuzzy ears there. So who's who's next? Uh, this is um, Kulfi, originally named um, Pia when she was a Ka. Um, this is a very moving story. So um, Kulfi was one of five puppies of a paralyzed dog named Hope who came into Ka when the puppies were very young. And actually Hope was brought to the U.S. Uh, in December. And in fact, we made a little film about her, which I think uh, Ka has posted. So you can watch this little film about the story of Hope coming to the U.S. and finding the perfect home. But we initially brought two of the puppies over. 
uh, and this is one of them. Um, and the adopter um, uh, had always, she and her husband had always wanted a dog from India. They had traveled to India and seen dogs in the street. And uh, the husband said, um, I don't understand why there's so many dogs in India where people have given them like Western names. I think a, a dog should have a, an Indian dog should have an Indian name. And I think a dog should be named Kulfi, you know, but the ice cream, we love Kulfi ice cream. And so he said, if we ever get a dog from India, we're going to name, we're going to name the dog Kulfi. And so they, they were looking for a dog, in fact, and saw the OPH Daisy dogs and chose this dog and named her Kulfi. And actually the husband was diagnosed with cancer and they adopted this dog, I think, while he was in treatment. And um, so he was a great comfort to the husband and wife both. The husband did pass away very sadly. And Kulfi has remained um, uh, a, a, a real comfort to, to the, the, the adopter, to the wife who has been active with, with OPH and has been a real supporter of the Daisy Dog program. Uh, and Kulfi actually got to meet her mother, Hope, when Hope came over. Uh, they did, we did a reunion of the mother and daughter. Um, and uh, they remembered each other and it was, it was very sweet. So uh, that, that's a real, again, a, a story of a dog really offering, we always say, you know, you see these things on, on Facebook or other places where, you know, who rescued who, right? The, did the person rescue the dog or did the dog provide a sort of comfort and something special to the person and rescue the person? And we've had a lot of people say, gee, the dog actually rescued me. And, you know, Kofi might be an example of that. Same with, same with coffee. And I think we have one more. We have five. We have a, ah, yes, Pihu. So speaking of um, paralyzed dogs, we have, um, OPH has been very supportive. And really generally, um, OPH and the adopters, uh, you know, have supported bringing more dogs and supporting dogs. Um, but also, uh, we do try to send resources to CAW to kind of help um, feed street dogs, to help, you know, pay some of the, say, the medical bills of dogs, especially ones that will be coming over. Um, so it's, I think it's been a, a great, a great partnership. Um, and we did get um, the okay from OPH to bring dogs <clears throat> with more significant disabilities. Um, sometimes those dogs don't get adopted as quickly. So we've kind of been bringing one at a time, letting that one get adopted and then bringing another one. So first we brought this dog, Hope, who I mentioned. I'm not counting dogs who are tripods because they really aren't disabled. Not many of them are, yeah. are just as active as any dog. So, but dogs with more significant uh, impairments. And so Hope came over, was adopted within weeks. Um, and that cleared then kind of the room for us to bring the next dog with a uh, with a disability, and that was Pihu. Um, also, like so many of the dogs, was hit by a car, um, spine broken in multiple places, and she was fully paralyzed in the back, uh, had one leg amputated at CAW. Um, and, but we, we did bring her over, um, and like Hope, she was... Um, given a wheelchair and discovered suddenly that she could run around again and she is unstoppable. I have gone on walks with her. She lives not too far away and we can't keep up with her. She just races ahead and wants to be out and about and doing things. Um, and she now has neither hind leg. Uh, the other leg was actually getting in the way and uh, she had no feeling in it. So that leg was taken off as well. And she does great. She can actually walk just on her front legs. We have her in the wheelchair for longer, for longer walks, but around the house, she just walks on the front legs. Um, dogs are actually, and cats too are, are quite good at that. Uh, and Pihu has been adopted as well, actually by her foster who couldn't let her go. Um, and it's just a, a joy. In fact, most of the pack walks we've done, Pihu is kind of the, is there and lead always in the front because she can go faster <laughs> than everybody with those wheels. So uh, uh, and her adopter, who is in fact the, the person who uh, does a lot of the interviews and a lot of the work with the Daisy Dogs, Jill, has been a big proponent of finding homes for these dogs with more significant disabilities. And and really, the the joy and the 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 power of their stories, or even people here who have had injury, you know, have had injuries or um, or are you know um, have disabilities to see an, an animal just be so joyful and so capable of living their lives fully even with disability is is sort of a joyful thing to share and so these dogs have really been a source of hope and and I know Jill has wanted to um, really have these dogs meet people and and share their their stories of uh, the abilities that they have despite what they've been through. So Pihu has been a joy to all of us really. And she's just the cute. She's also about, she's 16 pounds. She's tiny. She's a very little dog. And, but she has a big personality and she is, she is very loved. So we have many, many more happy adoption stories um, and many wonderful adopters. And, uh, but we, we thought we'd just share these, these five um, of, of dogs uh, all again from, from kind of animal welfare who have found really wonderful homes here.
All right, we can, I think, close this slideshow. Yeah. Okay. So actually, that's one of the things a lot of core dogs have. If you visit the shelter, they all have so much soul. Like they've all fought so hard to be where they are that you can feel that in them. They have such a strong spirit. It it just like when you visit there, you feel you feel that energy. I feel it's fantastic. So I wanted to address some of the questions. Uh, one is how often do dogs get adopted before they actually fly over to the U.S.? So uh, could you take that? Um, I'm not sure how how often they get adopted. So are they still adopted, in India? Yeah, yeah. Are they adopted prior to coming to the U.S.? Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. That's yeah. I I should have realized. Um, no, we don't do that uh, for a lot of reasons, but primarily is we really need to evaluate the dog first. Um, people will often see a cute dog and say, I want this dog. And I know even cause had the experience of sending a dog to dog to an individual adopter. If something doesn't work out and it really is common, the person who meets the dog and the energy level is higher or, you know, they, maybe they, they bark and the person lives in an apartment and they need to be in a more like a, a quieter, you know, like out on a more rural area where noise wouldn't matter. I mean, there's stuff like that. You just can't, you can't tell when they're still in India. And so we really need to, um, I get to know them first. So we've had people say, I'm interested in a particular dog. And we say, well, if we bring them over, then, you know, apply and, and we can work through it. But we don't, we don't line up adopters ahead of time. Um, we think that's probably, and, you know, OPH really is, is we're, again, we're doing, I mean, this year we've already done um, almost a thousand dogs. It's only August. So we're going to almost double our numbers. And at that level, you really can't be doing the match beforehand. Um, it's right, just, right. We, we think it's um, makes more sense to have them here, really evaluate them, and then the adopter gets uh, to gets gets to meet them. So we we haven't we've actually never done a kind of pre-adoption basically. Um, so it's always fly foster and then after evaluation adoption. Exactly, exactly. Okay. I mean, once we know a dog is coming, we will uh, about a week before they arrive, and this is true for both the local dogs as well as the India dogs. They will appear on our website as coming soon, and you know, so people can see them, and people will often say, "Oh, I really love that dog," and. Uh, so they can apply, and but right. then once the dog gets there, then they get to meet the dog. And again, sometimes they say, "Oh, actually, not the right fit," which is good. We think that's good. Then we we find someone who is, you know, where it is the right fit. Um, right. Um, but we we also we really don't, we also don't want to bring a dog, and especially with special needs dogs, I would be careful about someone saying, "I I will absolutely adopt that dog," and then when the dog comes. And maybe it isn't a good match, and then if that adopter walks, we the dog has to be adoptable otherwise. So we really we bring the dogs first and um, we, we find that that is the most uh, successful way um, that makes for, sense. again, that for, makes a large, sense. for a lot. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the next question is uh, how is the cost for travel and pre-travel requisites covered? I'm going to let you take this. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yep. Um, so uh, OPH um, uh, we, well, OPH and CAW will sometimes split the cost. It depends. Sometimes there's people and, you know, rescuers who are contributing in India, which is wonderful. We raise money here. So one thing we do is so every dog, there's an adoption fee for all the dogs at OPH. And the, those fees go to cover medical and just the cost of running the, uh, the organization, although we're primarily volunteer driven. Um, so we're actually a very uh, efficient group. Um, but we do use the adoption fees to cover, partially cover the transportation, the transport of the dogs from India, which really isn't that expensive um, when you think about it. It's the excess baggage fee, and then there's like the cost of a, a crate and a few other uh, a few other things. But then we also do do fundraisers. So the Daisy Dog Program will do periodic fundraisers, saying we're going to bring some more dogs. You know, please contribute. And we've been very successful at raising at raising the money. So between what OPH is already doing plus additional fundraising, um, uh, really the shortcoming, the sh if not short, the, the, the limiting factor for us has not really been money. It's been uh, flight volunteers. Yeah, uh, we had more flight volunteers. It, occasionally there'd be times when we didn't have like, uh, because there's dogs coming from the South, we don't always have lots of fosters available. So sometimes we do like, we can only find, we only have four fosters now. So we'll just take four dogs, but, um, typically the flight volunteer issue is the, is what is the bottleneck in bringing dogs. I mean, that said, we're not going to bring a hundred dogs at once. We can't really of accommodate course, that. So we usually will bring a, not more than six at a time has been the largest number, um, uh, that we've brought, but, um, but we've been able to raise, to raise the money, um, uh, between us. And then again, Ka will often be paying for parts of it as well. And we will, between the two of us, we'll cover, we'll cover what it costs to bring them here. 
It's definitely a joint issue. And we've also, I think, uh, Ko has written an article about uh, why do we do international adoptions? Because that's a very common question that people in India have that, you know, there are so many people here. Why are you sending dogs to the US? And honestly, that is something that you and I have discussed before as well. Like, we wish these dogs would get adopted here. The, the goal should be that these dogs find excellent homes everywhere, right? But um, until until they can get the homes they deserve over here, we will always make the effort to send them where they can get those right. homes. And, and you know, Swati, we get, I get the same question we all the time. Why are you bringing dogs internationally when there are dogs right here? Yeah. And we actually have a, a, a handout, a flyer that we, you know, uh, on that topic and have written on that topic. I mean, first of all, you know, we, uh, first of all, people sometimes frame the question like you have to do just one or the other. Well, we, we do both. Yeah. OPH does both. I personally you know, volunteer with the dogs locally and I contribute to local humane groups, including OPH and others. I mean, you could, it, it's not like, most of us have room in our hearts for multiple causes and, and organizations yeah, and all right, that. Absolutely. So um, we can, you know, it's not like you have to choose. Um, you know, secondly, I say in case of OPH, we are in fact mostly doing dogs in the US, um, but we think the international work, I mean, we see, we obviously see the need um, you know, there's uh, obviously uh, has many adoptable dogs and, and we can create space for more dogs for you to be able to help if we bring some to the U S. But I think the, you know, the last thing I, I would say to that, I always tell people is that sure, you know, we've helped 70 odd dogs over a few years. That's, that's 70 dogs who are in much better shape. There's millions more in India. Right. But the hope we have, you know, we're, we're, we're realistic and I hopefully humble about this. We're not going to change that situation on our own, but we hope we can have some small contribution as we call it a right. ripple effect where, you know, maybe people in India uh, who might be thinking of say adopting a purebred or, you know, they'll see, Oh, the, why are these, these crazy Americans coming and taking these dogs and adopting them and loving them? Maybe, you know, maybe we should too. Maybe there's value to these dogs and, you know, we're, we're not going to make that change people's minds alone, but between many rescue groups and the work that you're doing and local adopters, um, you know, we would love to have all dogs adopted locally in India. I mean, I yeah. personally would, would always love to have a, a daisy dog in the house, but you know, there's no, <laughs> if we could find local adopters, if we could find local adopters, that would be wonderful. And, you know, our hope is that by, by bringing the, a small number of dogs, but letting everyone know, and, and then getting supporters in the U S who then contribute money, um, you know, to send, to help the dogs in, in, in India and showing people in other countries and, and people in India, the value of the dogs and the, the the level of commitment that people have to them, that that can help right. in the long run to improve their lives in India. And, you know, in the long run, hopefully, you know, improved, um, you know, I know this, you know, improved animal welfare conditions in general, um, everywhere, India, US, I mean, that, you know, that's what we would love to see. So it's a, it's a small piece of the puzzle, but we hope it can be a contribution. Yeah. Okay, I'm taking one more question. Um, okay, so Divya wants to know if there's been cases of a dog who, after flying from India, have been returned and it becomes very difficult to find them a uh, next home. Because she's right, this is an issue that is faced locally a lot. Um, and it can be very frustrating, honestly, like a back and forth for the dog itself is not great. So I think she's asking how that situation is handled in an international adoption. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, w the way OPH operates is once a dog comes into OPH, be it from, you know, shelters in the South or from, from a, another country, they are an OPH dog forever. So we will take them back and we'll foster them as long as is needed to find, uh, you know, unless there's a major safety risk or something, which we really is very, very rare. Um, those dogs will stay with us as long as needed. So Interestingly, the the Daisy dogs for us, we have I think the longest we've had one in foster care was probably Bruce, the one in the Grand Canyon, um, uh, who I had for about three months. It just took it took time to find the right adopter, and it was January, so nobody was really adopting dogs. It was cold, you know, it was February. Um, so we, we see big bursts in summer and then like when people, when school used to start in fall, as opposed to everyone being at home, we would see another kind of burst then. Um, so we've not had a dog that we couldn't find a foster home for. Uh, I'm sorry, we couldn't find an adopter for. The, the people who adopt the Daisy dogs are very committed and, and then we really support them once they do adopt. Um, some of the dogs, uh, the 
other OPH dogs, um, there have been some that have been in foster care as long as three years um, or even more because they really are just challenging and need the right setting. And OPH stays with those dogs. Again, barring a, you know, a safety issue um, uh, where we really think the dog can't be managed. And that's very, very, very few cases. Um, we will keep them for as long as, as is needed. Um, but interestingly, that's not really the Daisy dogs. They kind of, they move fast. People are very uh, interested in them, even though they can be complicated and they, you know, they are so fascinating. Um, and um, we've really, I think their stories are very compelling too. Really uh, and it's a small number, you know? Yeah. Um, so we've, also, we've not. Uh, faced that. People over here, it's just like, you see the dogs everywhere. So you don't realize how unique and interesting they are. You know, I personally, obviously, I'm a little biased. I am in this field, but I find them really, really beautiful. Like they're very good looking dogs. I always feel that. And they're very, very smart and they, they understand people. They understand other dogs. And I feel like that's not noted as much over here because you're so used to seeing them around. They become they become background noise. So I think yeah. that kind of, yeah, I, I think it needs to be highlighted more. Like when you showed the video of Hope and how she's doing her entire story, you showed an entire journey which highlighted what a difference a home can make. And I think we really need to be doing that more, showing how much of a difference adoption of local dogs does. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of Americans really are, uh, I know we're getting close to time. I'll just say one thing. A lot of Americans are very fascinated by these dogs, their beauty, their intelligence, their, you know, they're, they're healthy usually because they haven't been, you know, inbred and, and overbred um, like some purebreds have. And, um, we took a group of volunteers, went to call a group of us together to volunteer there um, just before COVID. We were so lucky. We got back in early yeah. March um, and all the volunteers were just like, we, we, when can we go back? We love it. We love the dogs. We, they're like an addiction. We want to, we want to be there. And, you know, despite all the, the kind of rigors of, uh, of traveling to and from India and getting around, you know, cause kind of uh, not in, you know, sort of far out where the, where the rent is less expensive. And so we'd have to haul ourselves all the way down there. It just, there's something about those dogs. Um, and all of us who, you know, I've been fostering dogs from the South. I love them. They're wonderful dogs. I'm like, when can I get another Daisy dog? There's something about them. So yeah, I think maybe, maybe because they're familiar to people there, you don't realize how really cool they are. But uh, a lot of Americans are really, really excited and excited to, to help them. And again, bring some, but also help them there and, and, and get resources there to help groups like CAW to, 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 you know, get these dogs uh, into a good situation. So we will, we are committed to continuing to do that. Okay. So we're almost ending. So how can we, how can everyone watching this help OPH? How can we contribute to this? Um, well, we chatted about this bef uh, before the call started. Um, you know, we um, certainly there are ways to to donate. Though, if you're in India, I would I would rather you uh, donate locally because you know we, we. But we're we we also we have a page just for Daisy Dogs. Um, but especially, I think the best thing, and you can see our website. There is a international page that has the a couple of films about um, dogs we've brought over and some information about the rescues. And uh, actually, we'll be updating it soon, I think. But uh, you can see adoptable dogs, although right now there are no dogs from India uh, there uh, available for adoption. But, you know, really, I think what anyone who cares about this can do is 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 spread the word about the value of these dogs, the beauty of these dogs, the adoptability of these dogs, and then, you know, adopt yourself, foster if you can, contribute, again, just do outreach. Um, and again, if people are interested, particularly in this kind of these Americans coming in and uh, adopting these dogs, there are these two short films. They're each about eight minutes long. Um, one following a puppy that uh, from Ka that came to OPH and was adopted. And then one following the disabled dog Hope. Um, and they are both on our OPH Dot rescue org backslash international page you can see both of those films and they're easily shareable you know through facebook or other ways and i think it it, sh it it makes the case of you know why people love these dogs and and why they we love to bring them here and adopt them and you know that may be a visual way to help people um see how they can uh the, the value of these dogs so um swati i'm sure you've talked about ways people can help cause well yeah. um yeah. Uh, but you know, let people know that these dogs are, are, are wonderful with the right family and the right setting and the right support. They make wonderful pets for the most part. And we love them here. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they, I mean, they can really complete your life. Like adopting a desi dog can be a really wonderful thing. And I, I really hope people over here start giving them more of a chance. <laughs> Uh, I think we are all out of time, so we need to <laughs> we need to wrap up now. Um, thank you so much, Irene, for doing this. I have enjoyed listening to you talk, um, and uh, thank you so much to Dog Spot for giving us this platform so we can have this conversation. It's a very important one because we do get a lot of questions about international adoptions, and it is important that people understand why we why we do this. Like, why is it a necessity at this point? And what it is like on the other end. So thank you to everyone who tuned in. Uh, we're very grateful. And uh, do check out our links and support us however you can. Yes, right. and thank you, Swati, and thank you, Dogspot. This was a great opportunity. And thanks to everyone who watched today. Thank you so much. See you.